Okay, everybody, welcome to the first of many recorded class sessions that you'll have. Um, these are essentially lectures to introduce concepts to you. The reason we do it this way is so you come to class prepared with the concepts and then we can spend class time applying them. So today we'll be talking about general principles of effective writing. And then when you come to class, we'll have a, an activity that we'll all do together to practice and improve, or rather to apply these writing skills. Okay, what do I mean by effective writing? Um, you know, I like digging into the meaning of the word effective. Uh, if you look at the word effect, it means to affect something, means to make it happen. I think effective writing is, is unfortunately used as a very vague, ambiguous term. The reality should mean that effective writing is writing that makes things happen. Um, another way to think about that, and this is especially important for you in your career paths, uh, effective writing is essentially writing used to make decisions. Um, probably everything you write will be used by somebody in some way to make a decision about something. And when you, when you realize that, when you come to the conclusion that your writing is going to be used for decision making, well, it, it uh, should, should influence the way you write, of course, because you're writing usually to encourage one decision over another and that uh, ought to have the intended effect. Uh, so that's what I mean by effective writing, is it's writing used to make decisions, or writing used to produce a particular outcome. Um, the outline for this discussion will talk about the concept of plain language. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some ideas from the book, specifically the four C's, clear, correct, complete, compelling. We'll talk about what a cloud paragraph is. We'll talk about OABC format. And then, like I said in class, we're going to rewrite together. First of all, let me give you some examples of failures and improvements as it relates to plain language. Um, on the left, you can see the failure. And on the right, you can see the improvement. I want you to look at that and consider if the left is really worse than the right and why. Um, uh, pause the video for a second to read both of these paragraphs and decide for yourself which is better. Now that you've read them, you can see that the, the paragraph on the right is more direct, it's simpler, it's easier to understand, it avoids unnecessary words. Um, it's, it's just a plainer version. Now ask yourself, is there anything important missing from the plainer version? Well, yeah, the longer one specifies types of information. And that phrase, types of information, is not in the paragraph on the right. So we, it was deleted as a process in the process of simplifying. But, you know, that information may not have been important. In fact, I would argue that it wasn't. Um, the shorter paragraph is also a little more vague. It, it uses the phrase, how to meet the requirements. Um, whereas on the right, it, it, it gives a little more detail as to what meeting the requirements means. Um, but it doesn't really... Even though there's less information, the truth is it's better at communicating because there's less confusion, um, there's less wading through words. Um, let me give you another example. Um, on the left, you can see uh, um, the longer version. On the right, you can see the plainer version. On the left, you'll notice that there's a lot of words, a lot of unnecessary words again. Um, is there any information missing in the plainer version? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, the longer one specifies a degree of coverage, and that's not in that's not a detail you find in the paragraph on the right. The shorter one is also more vague, with may not be covered. Um, it doesn't give a sense as to why those things wouldn't be covered. Um, but there are a lot of changes too that it don't make a difference at all, where there's not even information missing. Like in the left, it says applicants who were. Um, on the right, it just says you. Um, and uh, there we're avoiding the third person by changing it in the paragraph on the right. And we'll talk about that uh, in this lecture. Both of those examples come from a website called plainlanguage.gov, which is a federal initiative to simplify the language used in government communi communications. Um, the unfortunate reality is that a lot of government writing is very legalistic, um, and it obscures meaning quite a bit as a result. Average citizens read government publications and easily felt overwhelmed by just the volume of words, let alone the complexity of the sentences. And it doesn't make governing any better. And so this initiative was started in order to simplify the language that people in government used. 
So we're going to dig into principles of plain language, and I'm going to go through a bunch of rules, and, and then in class we're going to apply these rules as we improve um, a prompt that I have for all of you. So first of all, the first rule or principle is to avoid the passive voice. On the top it says, regulations have been proposed by the Department of Veterans Affairs. That's a passive voice sentence. Um, the reason is you don't have a you, you don't have an action verb. You have to be as the principal verb. Um, have been proposed. The principal verb there is been or have been. Um, you should be using a strong verb instead. Uh, the improvement on the bottom is the Department of Veterans Affairs proposed new regulations. So rather than saying have been proposed, you just use the direct past tense version of propose and it improves it. You'll notice the bottom is just cleaner, simpler, clearer, stronger. So that's an example of passive voice. Um, another thing to avoid is third party as much as possible. Um, anytime you're communicating directly to or on behalf of an organization, you should be using first and second party rather than third party. Third party is when you talk about somebody. First party is the communicator. Second party is the, the audience of the communication. So here, the top example says participants in the program are encouraged to foster good sportsmanship. Um, there you have a third party reference as though you're talking about some other group of participants. But the reality is this is written to the people who would be in the program. They're the second party. They're not being um, addressed as the second party here, though. So you see we improve it by simply saying we encourage you to foster good sportsmanship. Now, third party use uh, is something that's trained in high school and college. You're taught to use third party because it's academic. Um, the truth is I think that's a major flaw of academic writing um, to say, for example, the authors would like to thank so-and-so. I think that's ridiculous. I think academics should just be saying we would like to thank. Um, I don't know why this in, this formality of third party has has gotten so deeply entrenched into academia, um, but the reality is it doesn't really belong in business or public management communications um, unless you're truly talking about the third party. But generally, you should be simplifying by just saying you and I and we and so forth. Okay, so get that out of your out of your practice that everything is in third party because it's not good communication as a rule. Okay. Um, Use strong subjects. Um, this is an extension of the third party problem. Uh, sometimes we get really vague in the subject of a sentence. Now the subject, right, of the sentence is the actor of the verb. So whoever's engaged in the activity of the verb is the subject of the sentence. In this case, um, the subject on the top is the word it. So it is important that the city council avoid the mistakes made in the last public meeting. Um, that's a really weak way to phrase something that could be improved very simply by, by taking the city council, who's the real subject of that sentence. They're just hidden and, and not made the subject anymore. Let's make the city council the subject of the sentence by saying that the city council should avoid the mistakes made in the last public hearing. You'll notice that you can also make it quite a bit, sh you can make the sentence noticeably shorter by using strong subjects rather than taking the real subject of the sentence and shoving them into another part. So use strong subjects. Don't use vague things like it or they um, or uh, that. Uh, those are examples of generally weak subjects. Avoid unnecessary words whenever possible. The top example, total disclosure of all facts, is very important to make sure we draw up a total and completely accurate picture of the agency's financial position. Uh, that's a real paragraph somebody wrote, by the way. Um, we can simplify it quite a bit um, by simply saying disclosing all facts is important to creating an accurate picture of the agency's financial position. So you'll notice what we did is we, we, we sort of condensed these phrases into single words. Um, so we got rid of very because, you know, very in, in, ahead of important uh, is usually unnecessary. Important is sufficiently important all by itself. Make sure we draw up is a phrase that's that uh, can be replaced by create. A total and completely accurate picture can be replaced simply by accurate. Um, those are ways we can just get rid of the extra unnecessary words to simplify the sentence. I want you to notice that the extra verbiage in the top paragraph is intended to add emphasis by saying things like very important or make sure we draw up or total and completely accurate. 
it gives the writer a sense that they're emphasizing something, but it actually obscures and weakens the paragraph. The, the bottom one is a stronger statement. It's more direct, it's also simpler to understand, and it's actually more persuasive and imperative. Okay, as you write, do your best to avoid hidden verbs. Uh, these, are, these are verbs that sort of get piled on by extra words. Uh, it, this is kind of an extension of the avoiding unnecessary words. On the top, we have the hidden verb inside this phrase, carry out a review of. Um, there's another hidden verb inside the phrase, gain an understanding of. Really, what I, we can rewrite the entire paragraph by just replacing those hidden verbs with the actual verbs. So instead of saying to trace the missing payment, we need to carry out a review of the agency's accounts. You can say to trace the missing payment, we need to review the agency's accounts. And instead of saying, so we can gain an understanding of, you just say, so we understand. Um, you'll notice that we sort of like dug the verbs out of all the extra wording. And it made the sentence better. So these are some principles of plain language. Uh, we're going to apply these rules together in class. Now, when you write, uh, it's important that you write according to the four C's. These are described in the Baker text. Clear writing is writing with words that can be understood. Complete writing is using words that are appropriately precise. Correct writing is using words that are accurate in their meaning and spelling. Compelling writing is using words that have the desired impact. Um, the reality is the Baker book has some excellent examples on pages 224 through 227. I'm not going to revisit those here, so I encourage you to go take a look at those pages and make sure that you follow the examples. Next, let's talk about paragraphs. I think one of the most common errors I see in writing is in the structure and the length and the flow of paragraphs. It's not that the sentences themselves are poorly done, but that the paragraphs themselves don't accomplish their intended purpose. Uh, let me give you an example of a paragraph that needs a lot of improvement. Now, I'm not going to read the paragraph. You can pause it, the video for a moment to read it. What we're going to do, though, is improve this paragraph, or this all what's on the page right here, by applying these the CLOUD acronym, Coherence, Length, Organization, Unity, and Development. Let's start with Coherence. The coherence of a paragraph refers to its the connectedness of the sort of the flow and connectedness of the ideas contained in the paragraph. A paragraph that has coherence, you start at the beginning with a topic sentence, you sort of flow through and the, the topic is developed and then there's a conclusion at the end. So that within so that each paragraph has a developed idea. This paragraph has a lot of information in it and needs a lot of improvement. But you'll notice that there's not really good flow connecting these ideas. Um, we can do that by simply adding one sentence already makes a difference. Um, after the senior care programs are hurting everywhere, we want to draw this back to the core idea of the paragraph, which is that these potential cuts frustrate our staff. This adds coherence to the paragraph because it helps the ideas connect and flow and develop the underlying concept. Um, we also, you'll notice, added the word last a little farther down because, again, this is part of coherence. We're saying, look, these are the things that, are, that I'm concerned about right now, about the looming budget cuts. The last point I want to make is, and that's part of the flow or coherence of the paragraph. Um, length is a common problem with paragraphs, um, especially in academic writing. Paragraphs tend to get much longer than they need to be. The truth is, short paragraphs are generally great. Um, I am not even opposed, in principle, to one-sentence paragraphs if they are having a special emphasis, um, or the, rather they're adding emphasis or clarity to a particular idea. Um, th the truth is, this can be broken into multiple paragraphs like so. Um, what we've done is, is we've recognized, yeah, there are actually underlying ideas here that could be further developed. So let's take the paragraph and chop it into three bits. Um, so first, the first paragraph now is talking about the looming budget cuts. The second is talking about the changing participant pool. The third paragraph is talking about finding staff. Those are three, those are three connected ideas, but they're important enough that maybe each one deserves its own paragraph. If you lump them all together into one big paragraph, you have them bury each other so that they're harder to identify and understand. 
Organization is important in paragraphs. Um, you need to have a clear path for or a roadmap for the reader to follow so they understand what's coming. Um, we're taking these ideas and adding organization by adding some topical statements at the beginning. Um, it, we actually added another paragraph in order to better organize and then added the word consider to introduce our first of the three concerns. Um, this organization helps give orientation to the reader so they understand what's coming. Again, if you want to pause at any point to see how we're improving this message, feel free. Um, but organization, good paragraphs have internal organization where there's a clear topic introduction, there's a flow from one to the next, and a group of paragraphs also needs to have good organization where one paragraph, like we've done here, clearly is leading to the next paragraph in an order that was already established from the beginning. Okay, let's talk about unity. Unity is making sure that everything within the paragraph relates to the core idea. So coherence was about making sure that one idea flowed to the next. Unity is about making sure that some of the statements even belong at all. Um, we're going to strike a couple sentences in the interest of unity. The idea that senior care programs are hurting everywhere doesn't really enhance that second paragraph. It doesn't make it stronger or better. It's distracting, if anything, because there's no evidence to support the statement that's being presented. And so we're just getting rid of it. Uh, we also deleted the sentence, I wonder about the priorities of this rising generation. You know, there's really no point in opining about the millennial generation. Uh, it's a distraction at best as far as this paragraph is concerned. So we're going to get rid of those. Well, now we've got four paragraphs, and you'll notice they're pretty short. And I already told you I don't have a moral opposition to short paragraphs, but they do need to be sufficiently developed, meaning that you've given sufficient evidence to the reader that they will trust you, that what's contained in the paragraph is valuable. And we saved some space in our unity step, so let's, let's flesh out each of these paragraphs a little bit. So uh, here's the final updated version. You'll notice that we added that we added a reason why the potential cuts frustrate our staff, which makes that paragraph stronger. We added an explanation as to why um, the change in average age of the participant pool matters. Um, and then finally, in the last paragraph, we gave some statistics to help shore up the idea. We added evidence to help shore up the ideas to why finding staff is increasingly difficult. Uh, these are all development steps that make these paragraphs stronger. <clears throat> so this is the cloud approach. Um, every paragraph should, should adhere to the cloud acronym to make sure it communicates effectively. All right, so we're moving on to the next concept now called OABC for short. That stands for Opening Agenda Body and Closing. This is a, about the entire document, not just about paragraphs. Every document should have an opening. It should pr provide the reader with an agenda. It should have a body that is an organized presentation of what the document is about. And then finally, a closing, which is usually a summary or even better, a call to action. Um, let me give you an example of the kinds of emails that I get from students. Uh, go ahead and pause for a minute to read it. Yeah, so the truth is I, I have never had a student ask me to be the faculty advisor for a Justin Bieber fan club, but I do get emails that are like this in the sense that they're not thoroughly organized. They, they, they don't give me a sense of what to expect in the email. They're insufficiently developed, and they don't tell me what I'm supposed to do. Um, those, are the four those are the four advantages of have following the OABC format is you, you do all the things that I just complained about. Uh, we are going to fix this paragraph by applying the OABC concept to it. So we're going to improve the opening by, by giving immediate context. We're starting a new student club, Believers Forever, and we need a faculty advisor. Bang! There's the opening. I know exactly what to expect out of this email. And they say, would you consider being our advisor? So they're not just asking me to find somebody else. They're asking me to do it. So that's the opening. And do you notice how much better that is? That one sentence or the two sentences put me right in context, and I know what's ha happening now. Um, then I have an agenda, which says, to help you decide, we'll explain our club purpose, our planned activities, and our expectations for you. That's great. 
So that's the agenda. That's what I can expect to read. And then as I go on, you'll notice that the body follows the agenda precisely. There's a purpose. There are the planned activities. There are the expectations. And they've even bolded and given headings on each of those aspects of the body to tie me back into the agenda. And then finally, in the conclusion, they've given me something to do. When you have a moment, please let us know your answer in a reply to this email so I know exactly what action they expect of me in the conclusion. I'm going to go back for a minute. I want you to read this again. Look how messy and sort of ill-conceived this approach is and consider this one instead. Now, to apply OABC takes a little bit more work. The reality is the reason I think it takes more work is because it makes it forces you to get more clarity in your message. And clarity can be hard to do, but following the OABC format helps you develop clarity so that it's easier for somebody else to understand. Okay, so that's OABC. Every document you do in this class and in this program should follow the OABC format. All right, um, and here's a nice little summary slide, and I'll post these slides on Canvas for you to have access to as well so you can see examples of the OABC elements in the message that was just in the last slide. So that's it. When we get together in class on Tuesday, we're going to rewrite together. And in the process of rewriting, we're going to apply these plain language concepts. We're going to apply the OABC concepts, the cloud concepts, and everything. Um, you'll be writing as individuals, then as teams, and then we'll be posting what you rewrote up on the projector so everybody can see and comment. And I hope you look forward to it because it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll see you guys next week.